Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 106. Gordon Whittington, Editor-in-Chief, North American Whitetail. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey, this is Jim Wellams, president of the Pope and Young Club, and you're listening to my favorite deer hunting podcast ever, the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Hello, my name is Merrill Sport. I'm president of the Hunt Channel, and you're about to listen to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registries, your hunting podcast. Hey, everybody. This is Kirsten Godfrey, the Kentucky Huntress. You're up for another amazing podcast with Jay and Dusty on the Big Buck Registries, your hunting podcast. Welcome to the show. This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registries, Big Buck deer hunting podcast. It's like that you're joining us again. It just, it makes my day. And today we have a Jay, special. Jay, yeah. Jay. Yeah. Are you there? Red. Yeah. Red. Red. Hey, can you hear me? Danny read the foe. <laughs> I made it, dude. I'm here. But you're on the up North journal. What are you doing here? I snuck away, dude. Really? I did. You think you, can I be your co-host? You know, it's a good, it's a good fit right now because Dusty's on vacation and uh, I need a co-host tonight. Really? Yeah. Oh, Jay, can I please, please, please? Did you ask? Did you ask Mike? Shh. No, not at all. What? Do you, what, what do you want? No, I'm not going to tell him. Uh, okay. All right. Um. He shuts my mic off, anyways. I know you wouldn't do that to me, right? No, no, I, I don't have that policy here at the oh, Big, Big Buck Studios. Absolutely See, not. That, that's why I had to sneak away. Okay. All right, Red. I'll I'll uh, take you up on your offer. Well, Sweet. you're uh, you're coming at a very good time. But before we we get to our guest, uh, I'd like to remind everybody that you can uh, pledge your support to this show by going to bigbuckregistry dot com forward slash pledge. All right, that's enough of that. Let's. Uh, so tonight's guest, Red, and this is this is something special. This is one of those shows I've been thinking about doing for years. And well, I caught a great night then. You have, and I'm I'm disappointed that. Uh, it, that Dusty can't be here to enjoy in this. Um, Dusty Schmusty. Well, I can't say that. He's He's been with me since the day one, you know. But well, Red's here. But Red is here. And um, I, you're, you're a great co-host. I mean, let's face it. Thank you. You know. I try. At least I don't get my mic shut off, but I try. I, I hope Mike understands what he's got over there. I hope he does. <laughs> well, let's uh, hear tonight's guest, Gordon Whittington, who is the editor in chief of North American Whitetail Magazine. Have you ever Sweet. heard of? You must have heard of Gordon. I mean, everybody's at least read at least one of his articles over the years. He's probably got so much deer hunting knowledge and stories wrapped up in his tip of his pinky than I would probably ever have in my lifetime. Yeah, and he is. He, I mean, he does. And has been doing for 30 years, what our goal is to do here on this show is to go get those great deer hunting stories in audio format, in the podcast format. He's been doing it in the, the with his pen for years and years and years. His pen, his typewriter, and I'm sure it's probably his computer now. Now his computer and, and, and uh, Facebook and social you know, media. Yeah. He, he, there's, gotta, there's probably going to be some really good stories, so everybody better be paying attention. I, I know I am. I'm going to be glued. To, I'll probably listen to it a dozen times after this. Uh, but let's get Gordon and uh, let's see. Uh, let's see what he's doing today. Sounds good. Okay. Gordon Whittington, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, Gordon? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Doing doing quite well. Thank you for asking. Uh, Danny, how you doing over there? Oh, man, I'm doing fantastic. I'm ready to go. All right. Excellent. Uh, Gordon, I, I asked you to be on the show uh, today because I can't think of too many people that have the resume that you do that would put you in the category of expert big deer storyteller. 
Um, you probably have more and you've probably forgotten about more big deer than I'll ever know about. Well, I, I have been blessed, and that's, that's that's really the way I look at it. I have been blessed to have come along the right place at the right time. Uh, just when this trophy thing was gearing up, really, with white-tailed deer, um, while they'd always been popular, it wasn't really until about the time I got out of college in the late 70s that people started to expand their horizons and think about scoring and become aware of giant deer and part of that obviously was north american whitetail itself uh, and i came aboard not long after it was actually founded in the early 80s so i've been able to kind of put my surfboard up on top of that wave and it's been a great wave and ride it for a long way and so i I think some of that was just fortuitous in terms of timing and right guy right place right time but you know i i would say that it it is uh once in a while i think about it you know it's like if people could put their hands on the deer that I've, you know, even this week, I mean, the deer I've had my hands on this week are some of the greatest white tails of all time. And that, that is a truly a special privilege. That's really amazing, especially to, to the, our audience. And to me in particular, that's, that's one of the things that I have been chasing a little bit are the stories behind the deer in an audio setting and only audio setting. I mean, you've been able to write about this stuff for 30 something years. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's really, if you go back to the early 80s, uh, I was writing some regional, you know, general outdoors content when, in my native Texas. And then when I moved over here in 84 uh, to Georgia at the, and went to work in the, at the headquarters of North American Whitetail, I, I really shifted more heavily into in what my greatest love was anyway, which is whitetail deer. And because uh, I'd, grown, I'd grown up on a ranch in Texas where, you know, I started deer hunting when I was five years old. I, I think I shot my first one when I was seven, I was sitting on my grandpa's knee in a ground blind out in the middle of an oat field. And I, you know, and I and my nice. parents had a meat processing plant at the time that was, uh, uh, you know, most of the year they processed livestock, but during the fall they processed anywhere from seven hundred to a thousand deer killed locally. And so I grew up in the middle of that as well. So I was just, I was kind of a deer guy without even maybe trying to be, but I, it, it was just always my love. And so it, it just worked out that way. Well, it's good you, so, lo- you loved it because it sounded like you were inundated with it around, all around. Yeah, that's a good problem to have. You know, if you're, if you're an outdoorsman and I grew up at fishing and hunting and just doing everything outdoors and it just, to me, it just, my, my, my talents such as they are led me in a direction of, I was never going to be an engineer you know, I wasn't going to be a, you know, a lot of things, but I did have a, some ability to work with words and I had an interest in in a a kind of a passion for that. So being able to then build on that and turn that into a true career. And now I'm about to turn 60 and it's really all I've done since I got out of college. So was, so was, so growing up with all those outdoors in mind, when you went to college, was that, that was your, that was your scope was to head right for that field or were you thinking of something else, but ended up? Well, I, I, in high school, I had, I had, uh, went to a very small high school. I'm one of 22 seniors in my senior class at Johnson city, Texas in 1974. There were 22 of us literally. So it's not like I had visions that I was going to go on and be the editor of Time Magazine or something, but uh, and didn't and frankly didn't want to. I, I just wanted to kind of just be able to take whatever my abilities were and be able to utilize them, writing about things I enjoyed. And so I didn't know if it was going to be going into mainstream sports writing uh, or outdoor writing, but as it turned out. You know, I think it it led me in the direction I really wanted to be. I mean, I you know, general sports writing is kind of a shark tank, and and honestly, it's just you know, there's a grind to it. I've done enough of it to know that you know, I'd much rather write about beer than write about a football game. Right, much more exciting. Yep. Yeah, I tell you, you know, the thing about writing too that's different from television, and having having spent a fair bit of time in front of a TV camera as well, I, you know, the thing about writing is you can let your imagination roam, and it's up to you to paint the picture. But in otherwise, you, but on television, you're, you're you're doing some of that. But frankly, if your cameraman isn't doing his part, or if the conditions won't allow him to do his part, and frankly, part of that is the deer allowing him to do his part then you're really, you're having a hard time telling the story you either feeling or that you want to tell. Whereas in print, you're starting out with a blank computer screen, just the way we used to start out 40 years ago with a blank piece of paper. 
And it's up to you to paint that picture, and you have the ability to do that in words, whereas sometimes it's extremely difficult in the in a visual medium. Gotcha. Is Would you say that writing today is as important as it was 25 years ago? Well, to me, honestly, I, I can understand why the question comes up, because there are perhaps there's a perception that if people are reading more today, it's only because they're reading what's on Facebook or what's what's in a text. Right. And or to scroll across the bottom of, of, of a TV newscast or something. but And maybe people are reading more than they ever were before, but it's not in a classic form that I grew up with. Uh, however, I would also say that, like at North American Whitetail, we just we have as big a readership as we've ever had, even you know back in what many people would call the heyday, perhaps, of the trophy mania. And, and that just tells me that, you know, the reader is still there. A lot of people have abandoned the reader because they're personally more interested in television or something of that nature. But frankly, the reader, the hardcore guy still wants to read. Gotcha. Okay. So when was the, the heyday of Trophy Bucks? Has it come and gone or is it still around? Well, if you look at the record book, one could argue that, you know, as goes EHD or winter kill or, or coyote predation or whatever, you know, maybe so goes, so go the prospects anymore. Uh, whereas you would say back in the late eighties in Kansas, maybe in, in you know, Illinois in the nineties, maybe Iowa, even today, Saskatchewan back in the nineties, Texas, obviously off and on, you know, forever. Uh, there are places that are magical no matter what. It's just that, for instance, here in Georgia, where where deer were basically extirpated back in the early 20th century, and they started bringing them in, and they didn't have many deer in the 40s and 50s and even 60s, but the deer they had, when you caught up with a mature buck, there were some great, great bucks here. They were northern genetics, well-fed deer, getting age on them. I mean, it was all the components that you need, uh, not as many ag crops, but a lot, but well-fed deer. And there were some tremendous bucks killed here. But, but even by the time North American whitetail had started in the early 80s, the heyday of the top end deer in the Southeast was largely, you know, going into the rear view mirror. However, it was really just getting cranked up in places like Kansas. And, uh, you know, and today you'd say that, well, you know, where is the frontier if there is one left? And, and I get that question once in a while. In fact, several days ago, we were discussing the Mel Johnson buck, obviously coming up 50 years on October 29th will be 50 years since he shot, you know, what is still the world record typical with a bow and really hasn't been threatened that seriously that many times. You have a Zaff buck and you have some other deer that, you know, by a scoring, you know, judgment call or whatever, a broken point or something didn't quite match him. But, you know, nonetheless, there's been a lot of tremendous deer kill with a bow, but we're still looking at a deer from 1965 being, you know, and still a top five all time typical by any method. So that deer, and you know, at the time he was killed in Illinois in Peoria County back in 65, there weren't that many people bow hunting. Nobody had a compound bow. Nobody had a laser range finder. Nobody had trail cameras. You know, there was, there was a lot of things people didn't have. There weren't as many deer, but the deer had more age on them. And so, you know, there's been kind of a, a of a trade off back and forth. We're managing better, but we're also more effective killers now too. And so, in some ways, I, you know, maybe it's kind of an equilibrium there. But but the well managed places that have not had environmental issues such as EHD, drought, bad drought, something of that nature, I think, frankly, are still as good or can be as good as they ever were. It's just that, you know, there's more competition now, you know, urban sprawl. There's a lot of things going on that make it, you know, challenging, if you will. But I think the the potential for big deer is as great today as it ever was. Interesting. Okay. Give us some of the backstory of North American Whitetail and how you ended up working for them. Well, I worked at a magazine called Texas Sportsman in the early 1980s. I had been working uh, a couple of years out of college. I had been doing some newspaper work in Texas. Uh, they started a magazine called, called called Texas Sportsman, and it actually ended up being a, uh, a monthly magazine that wasn't very big, but it did give me an entree into a company where the people knew the people who were about to found North American Whitetail. They, they hadn't founded it yet, but they were on the verge of it, and I didn't know that. Hmm. And so I was working for them. 
and as as a state hunting and fishing editor for Texas Sportsman magazine, and they purchased that magazine from the guy in Dallas who owned it independently, okay. and brought it in to the Game and Fish Group in Georgia, which consisted of Georgia Sportsman, the Carolina Sportsman magazine. There were several that were they were building up a, a group of those, and I got in there early, and then as soon as I got there, they said we're starting North American Whitetail. We just literally here's the first copy of it. Well, the second issue of it, I wrote two articles for. That was early 1983 that those were published. So, so really, it just kind of it kind of morphed into that direction, not for any particular, you know, master plan on my part. Really, I just knew that that was a place that uh, I didn't intend to leave Texas, but there was that was a great job in Georgia, and so I've been here ever since. Gotcha. Now, how has North American Whitetail developed over the years? I mean, it started out as. Um, it sounds like they put all the right components in place in the very beginning. And what was the launch of it? Did they just launch with a magazine and and that was the the basis for the whole foundation? Well, what happened was that uh, Steve Vaughn, uh, David Morris, and a couple of other relatively minor partners who, who didn't really stay in the industry that long. One of them was an attorney and one of them was a a guy who'd sold uh, advertising in the in the in the motorcycle industry, and they were all four partners from Atlanta. Steve and David, and of course, David stayed very visible in the in the, in the whitetail industry ever since. But but they really they just personally said we're really into these big whitetails. We don't know if anybody else is or not, frankly. But we're let's let's just put something together and find out. And and part of the genesis of that, of course, was that they ran into Dick Idle. Right. Well, Dick was at the Dick was at the time, of course, and many many current listeners here will probably say, "Who? That sounds like a stage name or something." But right, from, right. Richard Idle, that's his name, you know, and from a North Carolina boy. And he, uh, he, in fact, he played cornerback, I think, for North Carolina State, you know, back in the day. And yeah. uh, Dick Dick's had a, a, a really interesting career as an antler collector, taxidermist, booking agent, now kind of a fashion. Uh, interior designer almost for, for upscale, you know, uh, is high, high country sort of a rustic type furniture uh, lines. And so he's done all these things since I've known him for 30 years now. And he's, but at the time he was really getting into collecting, whether it was the hole in the horn buck, whether it was some of these other great deer, he was really just one of the guys that was, was into that. And when he met these guys from the Atlanta area and they said, wow, you've got all these photos. He knows of all these giant deer, these deer are bigger than anything we've ever seen. We're fascinated by them. We wonder if other people would be too, but they didn't know how many people like them existed. And they said, there's only one way to find out. We'll put out an issue of it. At the time they put out the first issue of North American whitetail, David told me later, he said, I did not know if there would be a second issue of it because I didn't know who would, if anybody would buy it. Interesting. Well, okay. it's, it's, la- it's laughable now to say that, but at the time that was all uncharted water. But in that, but of course they were already publishing state hunting and fishing magazines. They could fold it in as an experiment, get it on the newsstand and see what happened. Right. That was late 80, that was late 82. Well, truly, as they say, you know, the rest is history because it just, it was an overnight success and turned out to just start skyrocketing from there. And really was the first national title that really focused purely on whitetail, big whitetails. I mean, deer and deer hunting had been around for several years, but they were a little bit of a different editorial slant. People like Texas Trophy Hunters Association, which more, you know, a club type mentality and only covered a region. They were, they were going from the mid seventies as well. I knew those guys when they started, but, but on a national scale to really focus purely on giant world-class whitetails, it truly was North American whitetail that started it. Okay, gotcha. Gordon, so, you, so, go ahead. so you 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 tried to get your you went for a home run ball trying to get your little niche in the in this industry, and you ended up hitting a home run out of it. <laughs> well, well, exactly. It was a it was a bunt that ended up going over the fence. So <laughs> it, it, it was because you know, I, you know the way you describe it, you're right. Deer and deer hunting was was out there, but you know they're up Midwest, up by me. Uh, over in Wisconsin, they get, you know, and then you come out with this, this, uh, just a shot in the dark. Hey, let's throw this out there. And wow, that's awesome. It took off. Yeah. You know, and, and, and we still hear from people, of course, they're getting to be fewer of them because we're all getting long in the tooth, but I still hear from people that say, I have the first copy and, and to a person, it's almost always guys, of course, not too many women were into it back then, but 
almost to a person, they say, when I saw that magazine on the rack, I remember seeing it. And that's 1982. And they remember seeing it on the, on the rack and thinking, I'm going to get that. And they said, I've, I've got them all since then. Or I've missed one or two, or I've, I've lost them, or the dog ate them, or whatever, the house burned down, or something. But I, they still got that first copy. And that truly does make you feel like, you know, you can say, well, deer hunting's not very important. It's just a, it's just a, a pastime. And frankly, that that in one sense, that's what it is. However, it does make you feel like the, the caretaker of something a little more than that when people tell you, that's been my favorite magazine for 30 years. And so you, you feel like, I better not mess it up. <laughs> right. That's a good point. Very good point. So if, Gordon, what's your setup like to write it? If you wanted to write an article, what do you do? Like, what's your... What's your, how do you, how do you decide to, to write one? Where do you set up? Do you shut the doors and lock the world out and, until it's done? Or, well, how do you, how do you go about writing an article? Well, this morning would be an interesting case in point. I woke up about 2.45, not because I went to bed early, but because I just woke up and I thought, I've got a lot to do today. And it suddenly occurred to me, I've got an idea for it, for what my editorial in a September issue needs to be about. And it's not what I wrote about last week when I got it ready to turn in. I've now changed my mind. I'm going to have to, I'm going to start from scratch on a totally different topic. And so I sat down and before it was daylight, I had my editorial for the September issue. But sometimes things just sort of, I don't know, as an editor's mentality is you're always looking for ideas. You know, you're not so much executing them yourself as you are just trying to generate ideas that you think are, you know, mean something to someone beside yourself. Otherwise, if you only you only put out a magazine for yourself, you know, you you better be very much like the average reader or the magazine's going to dry up. But in my case, I, I'm always inquisitive about ideas and new angles and things that I haven't heard. And, and I still kind of take it like if, if that's interesting to me and it has to do with white-tailed deer, I'm going to make the base level assumption on the front end that it would be interesting to a lot of our readers. Okay. Now, whether it's relevant or not, whether, you know, whether it's a regional sort of a topic that doesn't have a lot of legs to it. I mean, there, there there's all kinds of articles out there and, you know, good, bad and otherwise. But if I'm going to sit down and write one, I usually need it to be either a deer that's really under the radar and I just honestly don't want to involve any more people than necessary in knowing about it until we print it. And there aren't very many of them anymore. As you, as you know, everybody knows about everything now. It's all on Facebook. But right. but when you do find that special deer, sometimes I'll say, you know, I really do I feel compelled to write this one. And and I will, but it's it's not because I'm trying to save them for myself. Sometimes I just feel like that's the most expedient way for me to cover what I want done on that particular article. I don't write a lot of how-to. I, I guess I could, but... I don't spend near as many hours in a tree as a lot of other guys do. And I don't, I don't pretend I'm as good a hunter as they are. I mean, I, you have to be out there a lot and, and my situation's not such that I can be out there weeks and weeks and weeks every year anymore. Right. So is, is it a process to, if you think it's interesting, do you sit down in front of your computer, grab a cup of coffee, bang it out, and then that's it? Or is there, how do you go about like getting the, the, the content that you want to put in there? Generally, I will know what, you know, the framework of an article has to be. And, and, and that, I guess you'd say that's true of storyboarding a, a TV segment or any kind of content that you're, that has some structure to it. You, at some point there, you have to know at least kind of roughly what the, the highlights are of the outline or the points that you want to make sure you include. Uh, whatever the facts are, the, the perspective quote, quotes or anything from certain experts or people, then at that point, I'm just looking for some kind of a mechanism to, to lead me through that story. And generally speaking, you know, it, it, it's a hard thing to do. You know, some people are very good at music. I mean, I can, uh, you know, I, I can play music all day long, but I'm not a musician. Right. Um, you know, I can make sounds, but I'm not good at it. I'll never be good at it. I, it's not where my talent lies. But I have a, I have more talent, at least relative to that, in trying to write and construct, you know, words on paper, by far than I do with music. Some people are totally the opposite. Some people say, well, I can't do either one. Some people say, I, hey, I'm gifted. I can do both. Well, for me, I just have to look for an idea that I think. It's kind of going to grab you and pull you into the story to start with. You know, if it's if it's a deer that's big enough, it's a Milo Hansen buck. 
it doesn't take much. Just get out of the way of the story and tell it. You know, right. don't don't get you, don't get yourself in the middle of it. People want to see the New World Order typical. However, sometimes the the deer is relatively, and I say only in a relative sense, the deer is quote ordinary by world class deer standards. However, there's some real freaky story with it, and it's just one of those one of those great classic hunting stories or. It's got some twists and turns to it, and so you know that you want to. You, you're sitting down there, you're trying to to dump them into the article to start with, but you may end up massaging it heavily to get them into final form. And frank, frequently, I mean, people think, well, how much do you edit people's work that they send into the magazine? My response, and it's honest, is I edit their stuff less than I edit mine. Okay. You know, I'll rewrite mine ten times. I might have to rewrite somebody's you know, story how to kill the state record buck because he's not a writer. But I, I can assure you, if I'm writing an article, I, I, I rework it more than I mine than I do his. And so that's maybe that just the nature of feeling like there's always a better way to do it. You know, you look at it and you say, well, I, that's not how I want to put it, or I should move this around or whatever. It's it's a little bit like, um, I guess it's like, like painting or anything else. You just, at some point, you just feel like, well, I'm not satisfied with it but it's the best i can do under the circumstances and then you move on right no i get <laughs> and, it and so it's, it's really it's really not anything more more structured than that and i know people write in different ways some people can sit down and, and just dump it into a file and have it pretty close to finish within an hour and for me i may work on it in bits and pieces for a month okay how do you end up finding your stories do you use social media to, to dig up the story first and then investigate and go deeper after the fact? And do you have to go deeper these days than you used to? Because there's all that superficial stuff on uh, Facebook and YouTube about something that happened. Well, it, it, it is interesting. I have actually found several people who have become good contributors for us, um, primarily writers, but in some cases photographers, because I am extremely, extremely active on Facebook and that's also helped me to be visible in a way that people may say, well, I recognize that guy's name. He's with North American Whitetail. My cousin just shot a really, found a giant set of sheds or something. And so when they have nothing more to invest than to hit the instant message button and, and shoot me a note and say, hey, I, you know, you don't know me, but I, my, my cousin found a giant set of sheds. Well, sometimes that's literally where it comes from. Mm. And, you know, I've said many times that from a deer perspective, from a deer guy's perspective in the media, I, I kind of still regret the day the internet was invented because prior to that, some of us had already put the legwork in to develop the personal networks that allowed us to, to find out about the best stuff first. Gotcha. But that's, that is progressively harder by the moment when, you know, a deer can still be kicking in the back of some guy's truck in Illinois and a kid in Bangladesh with a smartphone knows it, <laughs> you know, right. I mean, literally, I mean, the deer's not right. even dead yet. Right. You know, and so all of a sudden it's a free for all kind of a shark tank deal. And, but, you know, honestly, I, you know, I've often said that, you know, I didn't feel like we'd ever lost out on a, on a, on a breaking story that I really felt like was critical to have. And I, and I, I think that's, I mean, that's a blessing. We've, we've been fortunate in that regard. And, I suppose our reputation for you know dealing with people well and presenting their deer with respect and hopefully having a positive um, just overall feel to the stories that we publish. We're not looking to create controversy. We don't want a you know a, a dark cloud hanging over a deer because we're not going to grill a kid over you know was it thirty or thirty one minutes past sundown when he killed it. I'm assuming that if he didn't get a ticket and the kid acts like he's legit or whoever he is, then as far as I know, it's not up to me to try to find something wrong with the deer. I mean, it's, you know, I'm not going to suspect that every big deer is poached. I know there are people that have that attitude, but I'm just not one of them. And, and so I just, I just treat people the way I would want to be treated when I'm talking to them about doing their stories. And we've been lucky to have some people say, you know, I didn't want to do my article, but I'm comfortable with you. I can tell you want to do a good job with it. And so let's, let's go ahead and do it. So, I really do feel like that's something that we've, we've tried to cultivate and, and hopefully live up to. Gotcha. Okay. Do you, do you think that the world needs a scoring system or is it just, or should it be more about the deer itself? Well, the older I get, of course, the less hunting is about the score of the deer, 
because I'm I'm convinced that scoring in some cases it just it totally depends on the person. There are people who honestly do not care what their deer scores, whether it's a world record or a spike. I don't think it matters to them. That's not why they hunt. There are other people who it's a their social you know stature within a community, especially some rural communities. Still, there's and I say this having grown up as a ranch kid myself, it was a big deal if you'd kill the 10 point or nobody else in your class would kill anything bigger than a nine, you know? So right. that's, there's right. always, there's always that competitive ego aspect, I believe, to hunting and fishing, the stringer shot, who caught the big one, you know, and all the, and frankly, unfortunately, all the cheating that comes with that, whether fishing tournaments with fish with sinkers in their belly or guys cheating and molding racks and trying to pass them off. And, you know, so there's, there is clearly that element still to it where people perceive of getting an advantage by having a higher number on a, on a score sheet. That said, I think as the average age of our hunting, hunting population has increased, I think people have kind of gotten over, you know, the, the antler craze a little bit. I'm not saying entirely because they, they, they still would rather kill a big rack than have a smooth jawbone on a deer i think you know i think that right, <laughs> I think right, they would right. they, they still want to kill a trophy animal but at the same time more people are, are buying into the, the total experience the the growing the deer the the enjoyment taking the kids hunting video in their hunts uh, you know just enjoying a piece of property with their family i i do think because of demographics is, and and also just the the life cycle of the trophy boom if you will that we are coming closer to an equilibrium there where it's not just a total antler mania like it was 20, 25 years ago. Okay. That makes sense. All right. I'd like to talk about some of the bucks that you've been involved with over the years, Gordon, if that would be all right. Uh, Sure. One of the, and I think we'll just kind of reminisce a little bit here and then pick your brain and you can tell us what you know about these bucks more than, um, it, if you haven't read the articles that you've written or just maybe you haven't read an article on it yet, but um, we'd like to hear kind of what, what your experience was with that buck. Um, sure. One in particular I noticed, and I'm just on your fan page, I've, I noticed that um, Pat Hogan is standing next to the hole in the horn buck uh-huh. from, from 1940. What's the story on that buck? I know the story, but I'd, I'd like to hear it from you. There, There is a... Uh... You know, it seems like the the longer it goes, after 75 years now, you would think that, well, there's surely everything's ever been turned up. <laughs> it didn't ever turn up on a deer. And, right. and yet, you know, in some of these cases, because you don't really, uh, I mean, you just have to go, go by bits and pieces and tidbits. I mean, the official story was always, obviously, the deer was, you know, there wasn't any deer season of any type in Ohio at that time, 1940. Portage County, Northeast Ohio, the, the Ravenna Arsenal was just just prior to World War II. They were building up the munitions in there, you know, anticipating war, and there was a lot of activity in the arsenal. Train track right outside of it near the little town of Wyndham. Uh, one winter day, they a bunch of guys are gathered around down there, and they're trying to figure out what's what's dead under the fence from the outside, with his head stuck you know stuck under, going toward the arsenal, and come to find out it's this giant, incredible deer that you know some of the guys thought well it's an elk it's a moose we don't know what it is but then another guy said well no it's a guy named george winters said hey no that's a deer he, he was a deer hunter from pennsylvania and he recognized that at least it was a deer even though it wasn't like any deer he'd ever seen but he knew it was a deer and so after that of course the rat got mounted went to no scoring system at the time at least in the modern scoring system and deer ended up in the old bar there in the social club in the town of kent a few miles away and the Canadian club and hung there for 40 years until Dick Idle quote discovered it. I think a couple of collectors had seen pictures of it and heard about it, but nobody thought it was as big as it was. Mm. And when he got there, he, he, he struck a deal to buy it, which totally legal in Ohio to buy antlers. And, uh, and after that, the, you know, the, the whole thing blew up because the initial score on that deer was higher than the Missouri uh, Monarch, you know, it, right. it, which scored three thirty three and seven eighths, but they got a, they got a score over 342 on the hole in the horn with his entry score, leading everyone to assume that, well, he's he is going to be the new world record. Now, he got knocked down to 328 and 28 when he went to panel several years later. Uh, and I know some of the guys that were on that panel in 1986, and they said, look, we we scored him right. He, but there's other people that say, well, the guy who entry scored him, Phil Wright, literally had written the most recent record book for Boone and Crockett. 
So how could you say Phil Wright was wrong? Uh, and I so, see. you know, thus, thus began a long controversy. And many people still feel like regardless of what they score, you know, if both bucks walked out together, most people I talked to at least would say, I'd shoot the hole in the horn first. You know, you could have the other one. I'd take him first, even though he's number two in the record book. Well, you know, regardless, he's a giant deer. But then, of course, the hole in the, quote, horn on that right drop time mm -hmm. has always been a subject of fascination and mystery and intrigue because clearly it's not a natural hole. But we could never figure out exactly what caused it. And George Winters himself told me, this is in 1995, he's passed away since then, but I went to visit him after he retired to Florida. And um, he told me, he said, I'm telling you, he said, when we got to that deer lying dead under the fence, it was frozen into the ground, but when we started to try to pull him out from under there, the fence would move. And that, that some of that chain link fence, the piece of it that was straight on the end, that deer had jammed it through that antler, and that's where the hole came from. Mm, interesting. So, you know, does that make does that make sense? Dick Idle and I talked about it after that, and I said, Dick, I, it's the best story I've got. I don't know. Everything else has been total speculation. Oh, 22 bullet, blah 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 blah. Well, it doesn't look like a bullet hole. But he said that he said I can see maybe that could happen. You know, drop time being relatively porous, giant bodied deer, adrenaline, hit it hard, maybe just. Shugged. Who knows? I mean, but that's what George said. And George was very clear headed and still a sharp guy in his mid seventies at that time. Um, so, you know, best, best information and as close to an eyewitness as we could find. So regardless of what caused the hole, it didn't affect scoring. It was not anything that, that, uh, that, that broke off any antler or anything. It didn't affect how it was scored. But it did add a certain level of intrigue to that story that had he just been the old buck found dead by the railroad track, I don't know that he'd have had that mystique about him, but the hole in the horn is just a cool name. Yeah, it's a great name. You know, you know I mean, it's a great name. And it, at the time, it was just like they thought about, hey, we're, we're calling the railroad buck. Now, this is the guy that North American Whitetail and Dick and all of them trying to figure out what to call him because he didn't have a name with him. But, well, we're calling the railroad buck. And they said, no, we're calling the hole in the horn. Well, it's not a horn, it's an antler. Yeah, but hole, hole in the antler sounds stupid. <laughs> hole in the horn sounds cool. <laughs> you, need, you need a couple of H sounds in the, in the, the name. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's kind of an, an alliterative role there. So, Absolutely it is. And, and, you know, just one of those things that as you look back on it now, it seems like, well, good grief. That's How could you not know that deer was going to be legendary and truly one of the, the handful of most famous deer of all time and perhaps the most valuable deer of all time in terms of collective value and and at the time, he was just a big smoke-covered deer head, 40 years old, hanging in a bar in Ohio. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Do you, do you think people should collect antlers and, and, and mounts? Well, you know, here's the thing. I have never myself purchased an antler. Now, I know have many friends that are devoted antler collectors, most of whom collect for their own purposes, not just so they can resell and make a few dollars. I mean, there's all types of people, as you know, from antiquers and everything else. Who, sure. People have different motivations. But if you say the alternative is for those old heads to just finally vanish and never be appreciated by the public, uh, then absolutely I'm in favor of them at least ending up with somebody who's going to respect them and try to clean them up and get them scored and let other people enjoy them. To me, that's you know, the deer has paid the ultimate price for being shot. I mean, to me, the worst thing that can then happen is have a great deer that never sees light of day because somebody just didn't, they wanted to hoard the deer and the public never got to enjoy him. I mean, that's, you could argue that public has no right to that deer because it's not their tag on it. And that's true. But I, I like the kind of attitude among people that's like, yeah, you know, I just want other people to be able to enjoy the deer like I do. Right. You know, and if, if I put him in a museum, if I, donate him. If I sell him to this guy, he'll, he'll do him right. And so in that sense, where it doesn't contribute to the actual illegal procurement of the deer, you know, poaching or whatever, then I honestly don't see how it hurts anything. In fact, it may help. Right. I agree. I think, it, I think it is important and, and I, I'm fascinated with some of the specimens that people will collect. And I think it does, I think it helps us out in a lot of ways. Yeah, you know, and there's people that collect all sorts of things that are far more obscure to me than deer antlers are. I mean, there's one certain type of 
aspirin bottles from the 1870s. I mean, there's people that they have whole clubs that are devoted to that sort of stuff. I'm like, man, that's, I'm going to collect antlers. <laughs> right. No, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm looking at a, another picture on your, your fan book or yeah, fan page on Facebook. And mm-hmm. it, it's a fascinating picture. And uh, it's the, the title is uh, wrapping up a quick reunion with some close friends. <laughs> Yes, it is basically, I stood next to a bunch of deer heads lying on the floor after we shot some big buck profiles for TV, and I just, as best I could without tripping on an antler and impaling myself and, and, and breaking a valuable set of antlers, I, I just shot kind of a panoramic view with my iPhone, and it, so it's, it's, it's kind of rough around the edges, but it does capture what I was seeing as I stood there in that room at Bass Pro Shops here recently, and just look down, and there were those. There were eight of the nine heads that we profiled were lying there, and again, some of the greatest heads of all time. Hole and Horn was one of them. Uh, the Mel Johnson, um, you know, typical from uh, uh, you know Illinois, 1965. I mean, you know, the world record Pope and Young. I mean, he's lying right there, you know, three feet away from the Hole and Horn, and I'm standing between them, thinking, you know, I've been blessed. <laughs> right. Which, uh, so what, what are the deer heads in this picture? I, I recognize a couple, but I want to see if I'm uh, right. the, yeah, let's see. You got the Chris Tice would be on the far left end. That's a 279 and one eight Kansas rifle kill from, well, that was so long ago that Jim Shockey wrote the story for me. That's how long ago that was. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Holy smokes. That's yeah. crazy. Jim used, Jim, Jim, Jim used to write a fair bit for me in Whitetail. We go way, we go way back to before he was Jim Shockey, you know? And, right. Uh, and, uh, and so way back in the day, like early 90s, I, I remember several articles he wrote for me. In fact, he wrote a humor series for me for several years under a pen name. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he told me recently, he said, thanks for giving me my start as a humor writer. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I served him well by doing that. I think he found his niche somewhere else, but, right. but nonetheless, back to the Chris Tice buck, that was a, that was a kid's first buck. Uh, he was in full velvet when he shot him in December rifle season, uh, 1992 in Northeast Kansas by a place called appropriately enough, stranger Creek. And there's no stranger deer really in some ways than that deer. He's 279 with 40 scorable points. And they stripped the velvet off of him to score, and Boone and Crockett wouldn't take the score because they deemed him a cactus rack. And okay. he most likely did have his antlers growing for more than a full cycle if you look at some of the antler formations. But he's quite a spectacular head. You know, 40 scorable is not something we see very often on a score sheet. You know, there are just not a lot of, of 40 scorable point deer. That's crazy. And uh, you know, Hole in a Horn has 45, and... You know, the Brady Buck out of Texas has 47, I believe. But there, there are not many that will, will hit the 40-point mark. Uh, for sure, the Chris Tice head does does that. And 279 and eighth is within an inch or so, inch and a half of the Kansas record, were it accepted by Boone and Crockett. Regardless, he's a, he's a mega giant. That's, there's no doubt about that. The kid's first deer. Hmm. Um, all, the, all the stuff you expect out of a giant deer, you know. Heck of a uh, first deer. Never, <laughs> There's no place to go but downhill right. after, what do you that. Do after so, that. Um but anyway, the Chris Tice is there. The Olaf Anderson head is in that photo. That's a that's literally an eighteen eighty six non typical out of North Dakota that scores, I believe, he's in the high two thirties, uh tremendous head, still on the original mount from eighteen eighty six. Oh wow. You can believe that. No kidding. So he's a little and looks better than some ten year old mounts I've seen, but but he's no, he's a great, great head, super heavy, dark, uh, just cool because he's so old. And at the time, the guy that killed him uh, was kind of a guy that provided. He lived in Minnesota. He's born in Norway, lived in Minnesota, moved over there with his parents, then became kind of one of these guys that would go out west and 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 acquire meat for the for the army forts. No tell whether that was I don't know whether that was actually buffalo or deer or okay. elk or what it was. But anyway. Anyway, and on one of those trips out there into kind of West Central North Dakota, he he kills this deer. I think the place he killed it is now under Lake Sakakawea, oh, wow. which of course is a giant reservoir. So I don't think anybody be hunting that spot again unless they got a snorkel. But right. but this guy killed the deer that in effect would have been the state record. Of course, there were no scoring back in 1886 or until 1950, but. He was the de facto state record in North Dakota for like 82 years. Mm. So, you know, pretty good buck. 
and uh, the fact that he's on the original head to me is just is, is so cool. You just don't see that much on really old heads, you know. Um, other heads in there, the Doug Siebert, the 244 out of Kansas with matching fork drop tines, kill with a bow. Just a great head, top, yep. you know, top 20, top 20, 25 head even now. He was killed, well, way back when, uh, back in 87, I believe. Yep. Uh, you know, there's other heads like that. The Mel Johnson head, obviously, 204 and 48, net typical Peoria County, Illinois, 1965, Pope Young World Record to this day. Um, let's see, what else is there? We've got the hole in the horn. We've got the uh, the Hill Gould head on the far right. That's that white colored antler, super palmated head. Yeah, yeah. Some cir- su- some circumferences. His fourth largest circumference is nine and a half inches. His fourth largest one. He's got he's got three that are eleven to thirteen. Uh, so he literally does look like a moose. Killed nineteen ten way up in northern Maine, Washington County. Fifteen sixteen year old kid killed him and literally thought he'd shot a moose when he shot him back in the wilderness hunting with two other buddies the same age on a week-long canoe trip in 1910 in the middle of nowhere. Wow. And he shot this deer, and they brought it back. In fact, when he got back to camp, his buddies were back there, and he shot the deer, and it was close to dark. He said, could not believe it was a deer, but then he got to it, and he realized, yeah, it was a deer. He takes the heart and liver out, takes back to camp with him, puts them down in front of the campfire, and he says, what do you think about that? His buddies say, you shot a moose. He said, nope, <laughs> it's a deer. Come to find out it was a deer. Wow. <laughs> two fifty. 259, Henny Gross is a little over 270, but he's 259 even uh, after, and he wasn't measured for 74 or five years after he was killed. So he was he was plenty dry by the time they measured him. And that's still 259 and still up to 13 inch uh, circumferences on those on those palm uh, main beams on both sides. And that's a main so just, buck from 1910? Mm-hmm. 1910, yes. From main, okay, wow. So, you know, and, you know, there's, and of course there's other heads there too. I mean, the, 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 uh, the Don Roberts, 1987, the high 230s, I think 239, even Kansas buff. It's a mainframe five by five, super, super massive. Some of these deer, they, if you say, well, here's, you know, one of the deer we profile score 239. Well, there's, there's people out there that think, man, you know, the hole in the horn is 328 and this deer is this and this deer is that. And, 239, why did you profile one, quote, that small? Well, 239 is never going to be small. We know that. Right. It's still a world-class still a world class deer. But that particular 239 is super impressive in your hand. It's not just because of antler density or anything. It's just some deer, when you get your hands on them, you're like, whoa, this is a deer. Hmm. Now, that deer, that deer is that way. Uh, he's a 192 and change, gross five by five, but he's, he sits up high. His be- his his tines are thick. We all know that that that's one of those features that you get nothing for on a score sheet. But boy, when you look at them and see them and hold them, like whoa, this is a lot of bone here. And that deer is that way. Um, again, so score doesn't always reflect impressiveness. But two thirty nine will never be small. No. If it is, I'd like I'd like to hunt where that's a small one. I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you know, there are all these heads, and 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 you and you think about it, and you say, well, you know, I've even told people, I say, you know, if you were in one of these museums, like Bass Pro Shops, classic example, because they have the most big heads of anybody, and and they're on public display, which is what's neat about it, and and they're very good people for us. We work with them many times, but to try to help the public appreciate and enjoy these deer and. They're great to work with in that regard. So, you know, I've often been asked, man, if you were in here and the fire alarm went off, you know, and you didn't know how much time you had to get out of here, right? And it was up to you to save what you could in this collection. What would you What would you grab first? Yeah. Now that's that's a fascinating question that I don't know the answer to, but I'd be hard pressed. I mean, you got the Breen, the Jordan, the Missouri, you know, you don't have the Missouri Monarch. You got the uh, replica of the Missouri Monarch in there, but you have the original hole in the horn. You've got many, many top, you know, top end heads. And I guess I'd be hard pressed because the hole in the horn is, is the de facto mascot, if you will, of North American whitetail. Okay. And most associated with us. And again, he's 328. As far as I know, he's as big a deer as there has ever been wild. I'd be hard pressed not to grab him first. But I would do so with regret because of what I would be leaving behind. Right. 
Yeah, yeah, as you can imagine, I mean, that's that's like saying, which one of your kids would you say that the house caught on fire and you had time to get one? You can't, there's no way you can answer that. It's a massively complex question. <laughs> it really, and I don't, I don't mean to disparage human life by saying I'm going to compare deer antlers to kids' lives. I'm not doing that, but no. you know what I'm saying? There, there are certain Absolutely. questions that you, that you just don't, you'll wrestle with a while, but you'll never be satisfied with your own answer. Right. Never. Of all the articles that you've written over the years, do you have one or two that, to this day, are your favorites? Well, there are some stories, not necessarily how I wrote them, but how I remember the circumstances being so freakish or unlikely, which is, is more, the, more the case, I guess. It's just unlikely the way it turned out. And, it was, and, and, of course, in every case, we're talking about great, great deer. Um, the one historic head that I would say I'm most proud of is when I finally found the first deer, the earliest deer in the record book, which is the Arthur Young typical out of northwestern Pennsylvania shot in 1830. Now, this was a head so obscure. I mean, there's nothing else in Boone and Crockett, even Pacific walrus, elk, moose, grizzly bear, nothing that's as early as 1830. In fact, there's nothing else that I'm positive of is pre-Civil War. But this head was 1830 up in the middle of the wilds of western PA, uh, northwestern PA and killed by a known hunter. And I'm like, well, I've never seen a picture of it. I don't even know if I can find this head. No collector I knew, and believe me, the collectors, if, if it's out there, somebody generally knows something. This head had always been in the record book since 1965, so it didn't get scored for 135 years after it was killed, so I'm pretty sure it was dry too. And yet everybody said, well, we've heard of it. We, we looked at that line in there. It says 1830. We're thinking, man, what deer is that? You know, but nobody could ever trace it. Hmm. I finally traced it and got it in my hands. And a very private collector person didn't want to be identified. In fact, I have went to great trouble to keep from identifying the owner. Okay. Um, but the cool thing is, cooler than the deer head is the fact that I also held in my hand at the same time the gun it was killed with Wow! in 1830. And Arthur Young's powder horn, I don't know if he had it on him at the time he shot the deer, but I have to presume he did, which has dates inscribed on it that were pre-Revolutionary War. <laughs> oh. Now, so when you have all that in front of you, you say, I finally, I finally got into this deer. And against all odds, I finally found it. Okay. And I've been given permission to write an article about it, just not identify anything and compromise it, but put one article out there for all time and let people appreciate, you know, the, the first of the first deer or the first of first anything, Boone and Crockett. And, but to me, you know, if you told me that, you know, what of that stuff would you take if, if the house caught on fire? To me, I, I, I'm always got to get the powder horn before I get the antlers. And yet, Powder horns like that are relatively common compared to 1830 Boone and Crockett whitetails. That deer still ranks like number 10 or 12 in Pennsylvania after 180 something years. So, you know, he's a good buck. But the fa most fascinating thing was to see the drawings and the etchings and everything on this powder horn and realize that that predated the nation. And, you know, so things like that will stick with you, you know, and you'll never feel like you captured it adequately in, in type or in photos because. It's just too overwhelming and cool a story. But stories like that, I'm proud of. And the reason is, I know how much effort it took to even find the deer. And if I hadn't found it, I'm convinced that the public would have never, ever known about it or seen it. And so that's things like that I'm really proud of. That's fantastic. So how, how did you, as an investigative uh, reporter, do, trying to figure out how the heck am I going to get to this buck? What, did, what steps did you have to do to figure that out? Well, some of it comes down to I've at least got to – there was a name way, way back in old record books associated with the head, but it was not – it wasn't anybody named Young. It was it was somebody else, and the person was long since dead, and I just – I poked around. There's where the Internet helps because eventually through enough different – just looking for certain names and dates and places and, and eventually in old newspaper archives, and eventually you kind of say, well – you know, maybe it's here. I don't know this, but I'll I'll just I'll go down this trail. And it, and at some point, I finally made a connection with somebody 
who had many years ago known the person that was in the record book as listed as the owner. And, and again, been dead for many decades now. But I was able through get passing a note, can you notify somebody you know that might still know somebody and a long convoluted process and it took it took years. But I finally I finally found somebody who was responsive enough and just didn't just blow me off, you know. And they weren't the right person, but they, they passed it two or three links down the chain to where it ended up with the right person. So, you know, there's some things you just can't you just have to hope it works out. And if it hadn't worked out, I would have still felt like I was obligated to search because that an 1830 whitetail, you know, the earliest earliest animal in the Boone Crockett record book needs to have something said about it and done with it. Heck yeah. Even if that's even if that's the only time it ever sees light of day. Oh heck so, yeah, it does. You know, so things like that. And it's a and it's a big deer. It's a it's a one seventy six ish um they're about six by six, you know, I mean, it's not like it's, it's, it's not like it's just a, just a buck. I mean, it's a, it's a giant buck. It's a giant. And yet, yet you hang it in the museum by itself and people would, would walk past it to look at the other, the one nineties and the two hundreds and the two forties and stuff. But if they knew what it was, I think we'd all gravitate to it. Right. And if you put the, if you put the gun and the powder horn with it yeah. and the date, I think people would walk past the hole in the horn to look at it. At least I would. Right. Until you get because the, I'm just I'm, I'm kind of into that, you know. Yeah. The, the backstory to me and to you and guys like us is important, and it's almost sure. like we we do gravitate to the story more than the buck itself. I mean, the buck is great. Mm-hmm. I get that, but there's a story behind some of these deer that are as fascinating as the the rack itself. Yeah. If I were just to sit down and say, okay, here are the trails we followed. Some good, some mostly bad, of course, but but some of them have panned out. And over the years, and the people you get to know, and the places, it really is in many cases the people you get to know. I mean, I I remember, I remember the moment the door opened and I met Milo Hansen, freezing to death in Western Saskatchewan on right. an early December morning in 1993. I didn't even have after finding out we could see him. I didn't even have time to go home and get clothes in Atlanta. Two hours later, we were on a flight to Toronto and then to Saskatoon. The next morning, we were standing at the guy's doorstep. Yeah. And and I, I, I remember walking in. He said, hey, here's the deer, eh? And then we walked around to the right and got inside the farmhouse, and he opened the door there in the basement, and several of his buddies were there with him and said, there he is, eh? Well, of course, it's just a deer head, uh, <laughs> frozen deer head ca- cape, fortunately. Yeah. But lying right there in the middle of the floor, and I was there 11 hours, with uh, Steve Vaughn, our publisher at the time, we went up there together and I was there 11 hours. I never put a tape on the deer. Oh, wow. I never took one measurement on that deer because I didn't need to. You know, you look at it when, you know, as big as a Jordan is, obviously the giant, but when you're looking at 213 net, 213 five net that goes with over 220 and there's nothing on him that's debatable. Right. You you know he's bigger than 206 and an eighth, which was Jordan. Yeah. You don't know. You don't know if, by how much, but you don't really care because after 79 years, you're wanting the world record to pan out, and this one did. Yeah. Um, but good grief, he's got electrical tape around, wrapped around it, bright main beam where he shot a hole through it. <laughs> there, there, there's a crack of light showing halfway into that main beam where he practically shot the things like antler off. Yeah. And of course, at that time, that at that time, if you shot it off, too bad. Right. You know now now obviously they've amended the rule. Right. But good grief, I mean, when you find out, he walks up and and finish it off and shoots it and tries to shoot it in the head, you know, to kill it. Right. You, it wouldn't take, it wouldn't take much to mess up history if you were Milo Hansen under those circumstances, but because nobody had a clue what they were shooting at or even had after he k- killed it, you know, he, he left it hanging in his closet shed in his, in his farm unlocked for a week after he killed it. Right. I'm never nowhere. He didn't even think about locking the, the door on it. He didn't My, know what he had. Milo was a, a fascinating interview of mine. We actually had him on the show. <laughs> And he's uh, a, he is, he's a it's super guy, super guy, super nice. Uh, it tells the story oh, yeah. like it was, it was 1993 all over again. And yeah, he, the, one of the, the elements or the, one of the pieces of the story that stuck out is how he said that he hadn't smoked in years. And the first thing he asked for after he killed it was a cigarette. He couldn't, <laughs> his hands were shaking so bad that he couldn't even put it yeah. in his mouth. <laughs> well, I even, I even interviewed the kid who missed the deer a few days before. Oh, wow. And, uh, 
he's an oil field worker and he'd seen the deer and took just took a quick shot at it coming off a off a out of some bush or something there and you're thinking well how 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 fate how history how everything about the history of what we're into is different by virtue of a twig uh, a wrong turn down a trail uh, two minutes after dark all the kind of things that keep you from killing a big deer or let you kill a big deer Mm -hmm. and you you almost look at it as providence sometimes that this was meant to be the Milo Hansen bug. And and where we've been so blessed, to be honest with you, Jay, is that we look at we look around and I say with almost no exceptions. I mean there's a handful, but almost no exceptions. The biggest deer that we've covered and the people we've gotten to know have just been princes of guys. I mean, they really have it. Mike Beatty, there's there's no better guy on earth than Mike Beatty. Mm-hmm. Unless maybe it's Milo Hansen, you know. So, so <laughs> you, you know, really, I mean, honestly, there's a level. It's just like it's meant to be that the people that, that are going to end up being the true ambassadors. And these, neither one of these guys was exactly elderly when they shot their deer. Of course, Mike was just like 31, and of course, even Mel Johnson was a young man when he killed his world record. So, you know, you look at these guys and you say, for somebody that's going to be there in the public view, or at least known to be associated with a world record deer. Um, for a long time after they kill it, we have sure been, you know, fortunate the way it's worked out with the kind of people that have shot them. And I, and I, and for that, I, I mean, I count many of these people as, as truly good friends. I mean, I could, you know, at any time I'd do anything for them. And I, I believe they would for me because we've just, we're kind of growing up together around these stories of theirs. And I kind of feel like they, they sense that we appreciate the deer and everything about them, that we really have a genuine love for what we do. And hopefully that comes through to everybody, but I'm particularly happy that it does that I can call up Milo or Olive Hanson tomorrow and ask a favor and they do it. And I haven't talked to Milo in a couple of years, probably, you know, I haven't talked to Olive in 20 years, Right. but they're just the kind of people that are that way. They're just good, regular folks. And, and so we have been blessed to, to have those kind of, pe- kind of people as ambassadors of what we do. Yeah, it is fascinating how that, that happens. Like nice guys shoot big deer somehow. So that's. Absolutely. That, that, that story alone is just amazing. And then like, you're right, it happens to good people. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there there have been some people that I sense that maybe something changed a little bit when they when they realized, hey, this deer's worth how much? And then, but because of their circumstance, their life circumstances, I think they weren't bad people. It's just that they they suddenly realized and or perceived that, well, this is what my one chance to milk something for all I can. It's my one chance in life, and so maybe they get a little bit, you know, heavy handed with how they approach the whole process and sometimes they end up blowing it because you know anymore especially the world's not going to be the path to your door just because you shot a nice buck but some of these guys have you know everybody's got a buddy that's that's an expert and their buddy's telling them hey man you need to you need to do this with your deer don't do that or you need to right. sell replicas you need to do all this well they just don't realize that what the market sort of their their deer and images and all that stuff it really is it's just not what they perceive it to be but I can understand why they dream of that. I mean, that's, that's kind of a fantasy. Right. Right. That makes sense. Exactly. And, and, and speaking of stories, uh, we've talked about all these bucks, all these other people shooting the bucks. What about Gordon Whittington's favorite <laughs> deer story? We've talked about oh, everybody it, else. What about yourself? Well, You've my, got to have the, one story. My favorite, you know, I guess most people would say, well, my, was it their first buck? Was it their first big buck? Was it their first doe? Whatever it was. I mean, I'm, I'm hard pressed to tell you that any deer mattered more to me than the deer. And maybe to this day, than the buck I shot when I was 13, this would have been, I can, it was about five o'clock on December the 3rd, 1969. I'm pretty sure that was a Wednesday and I know what I was wearing. Okay. <laughs> so that's, that's 40, what, 45 years ago, 46 years ago now. Um, but that deer was one, and this is a hundred, maybe a low one twenties, six by five is what this deer is on our ranch in Texas where they have tiny little deer in the hill country. And, and yet, you know, I saw this deer in bow season in October and I thought, man, I got to kill that deer. It's the biggest deer I've ever seen. Well, I hunted that deer for six weeks and killed him and nobody was with me. I killed him by myself. I mm. sat up on him. I did all, I did all the process. And I'm not saying it was hard because I mean, you're hunting in Hill Country, Texas and you're seeing deer all the time, but I just wasn't seeing him. But I finally shot him and I 
I don't think anybody could ever to this day be prouder of a deer they shot than I was of that one then. And even now when I look at that deer, obviously he's, you know, if I stick him in the middle of a bunch of other deer I've shot since then, well, you know, he kind of gets lost. But my eye and really my heart goes to him because that deer was the first individual deer I ever killed on purpose. And not not the first, you know, I shot an eight pointer when I was 10, but um, you know, that deer was the one that really kind of like made me feel like, Hey, I may be able to do this. I may be able to, to be a good hunter. And that in hand in hand with my interest and passion for communication and language skills was, you know, it just kind of dovetailed into place. And so would my life have been different if I'd never gotten that buck? I don't know. Maybe it may have been better, but they killed a bigger one. But I just know that I hunted that buck and killed him. And I just felt so much reinforcement out of that if you will right and and i still consider that one of the greatest blessings of my hunting career is killing that buck i don't care what anybody else thinks of him that's truly moot <laughs> but but i know what i think of him and he he's still as special as any deer to me now that 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 right there is awesome you got to go way back it just wasn't a couple years ago it's a way back story now the other question i have is what is your favorite means of hunting you know i did not grow up a hardcore bow hunter the way so many people did when I'm going to say quote up north but meaning you know just the Great Lakes and northeast and midwestern regions where where the gun hunting lim- limitations were so extreme compared to bow hunting we had kind of the opposite in Texas where I grew up so I grew up rifle hunting even from the age of five I'm I'm carrying my old model 92 you know true grit special out there and uh you know <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 hunting that way on foot you know in open country we had enough land that i could roam around i didn't have to sit in one little cubby hole all the time wait for deer to walk by I, I could get out and roam around and kind of feel like i was learning to hunt so i've always been uh kind of partial i love to bow hunt but i it, it it's i don't look at a deer that i kill with a gun and say golly i wish i'd shot him with a bow i know many people feel that way and i don't blame them but it doesn't matter that much to me so I really like hunting wide open rolling country that has some big deer somewhere out there and I can just get out and go on foot. That's yeah. and, and if I got rattling horns with me and a spotting scope or whatever, and I can just get out and feel like I'm with Lewis and Clark and just go, go, go. And what I kill or don't kill is up to me. And that to me is the most fun hunting, uh, you know, rattling in South Texas or Mexico, uh, snow track. And I mean, there's always ways obviously to kill deer, I've never, I've never hunted them with dogs, but I've had people tell me it's, it's a lot of fun, just not for me. So I know there's, there's reasons people hunt the way they hunt, and it's usually habitat related. Sometimes it's regulatory, but everybody kind of develops what they feel comfortable with and and what they really enjoy. And for me, it's just big open country. And and frankly, if, if I've got a rifle, we'll kill one at 300 yards and a crosswind. Well, you know, I don't feel like I'm uh, cheating. You know, I know I'm right. still out there in the middle of nowhere trying to kill a, a big deer that doesn't want to be killed. And and I just enjoy being out in wide open spaces. That's that's just awesome. So, Gordon, do you still hunt with the Model 92 Winchester 3220? <laughs> I I don't. And the only reason is that well, I went back in 1995 and killed another doe. Uh, in the same field with the same rifle, and for all I know, it could have been another shell out of the same box that I killed my first one in in 1963. No okay, <laughs> when I did that, now in Texas, in Texas, the 3220 is still legal. As you know, it's really good grief. It's almost like shooting a pellet gun on the in the right light. You can see the bullet come out of the barrel. I mean, it's that slow. Wow, it's 1,200 feet a second or something, and a tiny little bullet. And frankly, it's just not, I mean, it is a sub, sub-minimal caliber for whitetail. However, it's still legal in Texas. And after I shot that one, I got to looking at the ballistics and I thought, you know, I don't, I think I'm going to put the gun up. Now, the gun itself was a few hundred serial numbers off from the one that John Wayne literally used in the original crew grid. <laughs> of course no he kidding. had of course he, of course he had the big hoop lever on his and fill sure. your hand and blah 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 but you know i uh <laughs> mine was a little less uh celebrated perhaps than his but and we still have the gun um you know i just to me you don't get rid of stuff like that you know if the house burns down is the only way you lose it so right interesting very interesting uh, gordon we've uh 
taken up uh, over an hour, and I could listen to you talk about deer stories all night. And uh, <laughs> I would... well, well, I enjoy telling them, as you can tell, hopefully. And uh, and I and I've got plenty more if you ever want to do it again. <laughs> I, w- I would love to do this again. In fact, there's so many in my head spinning. There's so many deer that we could talk about that you've covered that we we could probably do a whole series to be honest but uh we'll let it go for tonight and we'll come back and do this again another time uh because it was, it was sure. enjoyable for me and i guarantee our listeners are going to love this as well what do you think about that danny oh i i definitely think they're going to enjoy this one yeah um i'm, I'm, I'm going to listen to it over and over because i think it was really good um so gordon thanks for joining us on the big buck podcast great is that guy smooth or what? Dude, that was uh, phenomenal, I'll say. I mean, we over an hour of listening to him and his stories, and we finally got a story out of him about himself, and he went back all the way when he was 13 years old. It's it's a great story. I mean, he has a great life story. What about what about that, the, how, how the hole in the antler, horn, hole, buck. Hole in the horn buck, yeah. Got there, you know? That's that a just, detail that only somebody like Gordon would track down and get or going back and finding the first deer 18 30s 30s holding it yep. holding the powder horn <laughs> the musket everything so it, it comes down to that and, and i agree with gordon is that yes you know we have all these amazing bucks we see these antlers all over the place and you go to any bass pro or cabela's and they've got the replicas hanging on the wall and they're beautiful and they they oh. capture your eyes you're like oh my god that's they're gorgeous they're gorgeous but there's still an element of these less large bucks that have even better backstories than any of the bigger ones that are hanging on the wall and they deserve as much recognition as any buck that's taken i think any buck really has a story and deserves to be told i mean you're, you're taking animals life it deserves a little something um, absolutely and 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 the thing that hole in the horn buck was sitting or well, actually hanging in a bar right for all those years gathering smoke dust everything right until and, and, yeah dick idol came around and said hey i'll give you however much money you want for that exactly and I, you know what and I, another good thing that i thought he said was um uh, about just collecting antlers just to you know people go out there and do it they've got some do it to make you know make knives handles out of and everything but just to keep them in circulation and out there because really some people get rid of them but then again some people you know others i i kind of like the idea just collecting them just to just to have just so that they don't ever disappear yeah yeah i think we should always um, commemorate any of these bucks and 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 do what we do really make replicas and spread the word and let people understand what the story is and where it came from and what it measured and all that kind of great stuff and there's some stuff we didn't even get to talk to Gordon about and because we did eat up our time and I, I didn't want to go over but there's there's so many other things that I need to ask him uh, that I think is worthy of a, a second third fourth fish show maybe I should even just start a, a the own you know their own podcast and really just Jeez, produce that. you 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 really could you really I could. mean I, he, the stories could be endless and it's, it's amazing and the way he tells them is awesome it, it it's uh, it's just a great thing that people can listen to over and over again and you know hopefully there's somebody out there that'll you know say hey you know and also the writing career that he uh, uh, has has had and hopefully you know if somebody's inspired to do that as well that they get involved. I, yeah, he's just an inspirational guy. So, and hopefully this show will bring some readers to his magazine and hopefully some of the readers of his magazine will be tuned into our podcast over here. And of course, to the up North journal podcast, which is where I stole you from tonight. Yes, you did. I snuck over here and Mike has no idea. Right. And you're filling in for the incomparable Dusty Phillips, who's on vacation at the moment uh, with his family up near you, from what I understand. And uh, we're, we're welcoming him back as soon as he gets back into town. So, But the show must go on, so we, we it continue must. to do this. Exactly. And I don't mind. So anytime you need a co-host, you just give me a call. All right. All right. And um, you're going to clear this with Mike, though, right? You're going to say tell him that, it's, that, you, that you did this? Why? Uh, okay. I like it here. It's comfy. <laughs> We treat you right? Is that what you're saying? Yes. You treat me with open mic. <laughs> open mic. As opposed to closed mic when I'm with him. So does Mike have a button, like a, a, a off 
on button sitting right next to him for your mic? Yeah, he does it right on the switchboard. He just does it when I'm not looking and goes, oops, I guess I got to turn your mic on. Oh, you wow. think? Oh, I can't hear you that good. Gee, you wonder why. <laughs> it's because I forgot to turn you on. Oh, wait, I didn't even realize you were off, Red. Yeah, exactly. That's but no, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to Gordon and being with you and gladly sit in the co-host seat anytime. Cool. I appreciate you filling in for Dusty. Uh, as you know, Dusty is an integral part of this show. And uh, I, I, it's it's one of those spots. It's just always more interesting talking to somebody else than just talking to yourself. And uh, I couldn't really think of anybody better than yourself to fill in while well, Dusty, Dusty's away. So it's it's really a good blend. And I'm glad I met you face-to-face at the ATA. And we've formed this good, good partnership with everybody. Absolutely. And you know what? That reminds me. Uh, Gordon will probably be at the ATA next year. Yes, he will. In fact, that's where I met him the first time. Exactly. Yep. So we'll have to hit him up again. I agree. So, Red, where can we find you when you're not on the mic? Oh, when I'm not on the mic, you can – you <laughs> when I'm not on the mic with Mike. When I you're not on the mic with Mike, right. Yeah. Uh, head on over to theupnorthjournal.com. Check us out. You know, check out uh, – you know, we became friends at the ATA show, and now we got the uh, outdoor podcast channel, Rocking and Rolling. So, you know, you can join us all over there. Excellent. Well, you can join uh, us uh, in multiple locations on the Big Buck Registry. You can join us at bigbuckregistry.com. You can always give us a call at 724-613-2825. You can shoot me an email, j at bigbuckregistry.com or dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. And maybe we'll get red at bigbuckregistry.com if he comes back and does this multiple times. Um, Just hint, hint there, red. Um, And um, if uh, you'd like to share a big buck that you've shot on, with the world to about 150,000 plus followers. You can go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck and you'll see all the instructions right there. Uh, we're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash big buck registry and Twitter, uh, twitter.com forward slash big buck registry. And man, there's so many places we're at. I can't remember them all, but um, if you'd like to pledge with for the, your show and uh, the support for this show, you can go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. I think that's about it, Red. That's awesome. We, we can find you anywhere, can't we? Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, just like the Up North Journal, but we're rocking it together. Being in the outdoors is a wonderful thing. It is. It is a wonderful thing to get outside. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dan DeFall. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. See you next week. Now, Dan, you say can't wait because that's what Dusty says. Oh, can't wait. <laughs>